Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? This is new to me. I feel like a pop star. Oh, my goodness, stop. Welcome to Book People. Before we get started, can everyone please turn off their cell phones? I'm sure your ringtones are great. Our guest is better. So we're going to do things a little differently tonight because this event is being broadcast. Most notably, the Q&A is going to involve a microphone, if not this exact microphone, very similar to this one. So when we're done speaking, if you could just hold your questions until I am in your face <laughs> with a microphone, that would be wonderful just to make sure everyone can hear you and that it can be heard on broadcast. Thank you all so much for coming to Book People tonight. We are an independent bookstore. Your business is the single reason we exist. We could not put on events like this without you. So before we get started, just for some energy, why don't we give ourselves a round of applause? We are thrilled to be joined tonight by author and activist Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. Tonight we'll be learning about Roxanne's eighth book, making us all feel lazy, <laughs> An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Roxanne has been active in the international indigenous movement for more than four decades. She received her PhD from UCLA and went on to teach in the newly established Native American Studies program at Cal State University Hayward. While there, she helped found both the Ethnic Studies and Women's Studies departments. Her 1977 book, The Great Sioux Nation, was the fundamental document at the Conference on Indigenous Pe Peoples of the Americas held at United Nations headquarters in Geneva. We are so thrilled to have her here tonight. Please join us in welcoming Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. Thank all of you for coming out this beautiful fall weather. You're having a little warm, but. <laughs> First, I, I want to acknowledge that we are standing at this moment on the tradi traditional unceded lands of the Tonkawa, Comanche, and Lipan Apache peoples, and it's unceded land. And the translation of that is stolen. <laughs> um, this book, oh, and I want to add, really thank book people. This is such a pleasure to be here. I so admire this show. I have never been inside. I've only seen it on C-SPAN because they have recorded uh, several times before here, I think. And it's a wonderful place, great audiences uh, asking intelligent questions, so it's very nice to be here. Well, this book, uh, An Indigenous People's History of the United States, is part of uh, Beacon Press's Revisioning American History series, inspired by the late Howard Zinn uh, in his classic uh, book, A People's History of the United States, which was originally published by Beacon Press. The peoples, in my title, has the possessive apostrophe after the S to refer to the more than 500 Native American nations and communities in North America. It is their history of the United States that I have attempted to write here. I want to read uh, from the introduction to the book, which I call This Land. And I want to quote this um, William Carlos Williams from his uh, against the, the American grain. This land, don't you feel it? Doesn't it make you want to go out and lift dead Indians tenderly from their graves to steal from them? As if it must be clinging to their corpses, some authenticity. So under the crust, of that portion of the earth called the United States of America, from California to the Gulf Stream waters, are in turn the bones, villages, fields, and sacred objects of American Indians. 
They cry out for their stories to be heard through their descendants who carry the memories of how this country was founded and how it came to be as it is today. It should not have happened that the great civilizations of the Western Hemisphere, the very evidence of the Western Hemisphere, were wantonly destroyed, the gradual progress of humanity interrupted and set upon a path of greed and destruction. Choices were made that forged that path toward destruction of life itself. The moment in which we now live and die as our planet shrivels, overheated. To learn and know this history is both a necessity and a responsibility to the ancestors and descendants of all parties concerned, but it's also an act of survival. What historian David Chang has written about the land that became Oklahoma applies to the whole United States. Nation, race, and class converged in land. Everything in US history is about land. Who oversaw it and cultivated it, fished its waters, maintained its wildlife, who invaded and stole it, how it became a commodity, real estate, broken into pieces to be bought and sold on the market. U.S. policies and actions related to indigenous people, though often termed racist or discriminatory, are rarely depicted as what they are. Classic cases of imperialism and a particular form of colonialism, settler colonialism. As, a, as Australian anthropologist Patrick Wolfe writes, the question of genocide is never far from discussions of settler colonialism. Land is life, or at least land is necessary for life. Well, writing US history from an indigenous people's perspective requires rethinking the consensual narrative of the United States. That narrative is wrong or deficient, not in its facts, dates, or details, but rather in its essence. Inherent in the myth we've been taught is an embrace of settler colonialism and genocide. That myth persists not for lack of free speech or poverty of information, but rather the motivation to ask questions that challenge the core of the scripted narrative of the origin story. How might acknowledging the reality of US history work to transform the society? That is the central question this book pursues. Teaching Native American studies for, I hate to admit it, 35 years, I always begin with a simple exercise I asked the students to quickly draw a rough outline of the United States at the time uh, it gained independence from Britain. <clears throat> Invariably, most draw the approximate present shape of the United States from the Atlantic to the Pacific, the continental territory not fully appropriated until a century after independence. What became independent in 1783 were 13 British colonies hugging the Atlantic shore. When called on to do this exercise and doing it wrong, students are embarrassed because they know better. They know immediately that that's not right. But I assure them they're not alone. In fact, I call this a Rorschach test of unconscious manifest destiny embedded in the minds of nearly everyone in the United States and around the world. This test reflects the seeming inevitability of United States extent and power, its destiny, with an implication that the continent had previously been terra nullis a land without people. Woody Guthrie's beloved song, that's sort of the alternative anthem to the Star Spangled Banner, This Land is Your Land, celebrates that the land belongs to everyone, 